Hello, this is Dr. Jim Thomas, and I want to welcome you to Fayetteville First Baptist Online. My hope and prayer for you today is that you're encouraged in your faith and challenged to walk toward a Christ-centered life. If you have any questions about today's message or would like to have more information on what it means to follow after Jesus Christ, please don't hesitate to email me at info at fayettevillefbc.org. I hope you're encouraged today. May God bless you. Good morning. We're so glad you guys are here. Stand and join us in worship.
lifted up, he defeated the grave. Oh, uh-huh. 
time, just the voices. Christ alone, cornerstone, weak made strong in the Savior's love. Through the storm, He is Lord, Lord alone. Amen.
tried to scale your walls in vain To cross your seas of plastic against your waves What for all miles of you to say Were you there to stop me this whole way? Have I tried to scale your walls in vain? Seas are pushed against your way. What the world might say? Were you there beside me this whole way? Always find me in between the thunder. morning. Good to see you this morning. Glad you're here. I want to thank uh, Pete Mercer. Thank you for coming and leading us in worship. Great job. Always love to hear your heart shared through song. Uh, glad to step in. As Pastor Kurt had mentioned, uh, Pastor Jim knew he was having surgery last week ago Monday, and so I knew I was on on tap to, to, to preach this, this Sunday, but he's doing well, as, as he said, and uh, they're, they're away at the, at the beach enjoying this Labor Day extended weekend. Uh, for those that you have kids in school, you know what I mean, uh, having Monday and Tuesday out, but glad you're here. Uh, so glad to have you here with us, and uh, in case you're new with us this morning, we just uh, ended a four-week sermon series entitled Thinking Christianly. It was about how to think like Jesus. It's the discipleship of our minds and how we think. The, the key truth there was how we think determines how we live. The end of discipleship of the mind is not ourselves. It's not about me. It is the action of learning how to love other people well. That is the goal of discipleship. And we have to be careful that we don't get caught up in a cul-de-sac of discipleship, if you will, that everything revolves around me, that it's all intake. Discipleship, at least Jesus' model of discipleship, is about building on ramps into other people's lives for us to invest in others. And that's what discipleship is it's following Jesus and leading others to do the same. The end, is, uh, the end of discipleship is not about me, 
It's about making disciples who make disciples who make disciples, if you get my point. So if you're a Christ follower here this morning, then you're invited to be a part of this, and so am I. In Matthew chapter 22, verse 34 and following, Jesus was asked, what is the greatest commandment? We heard that a lot through the Thinking Christianly series, but Jesus replied and said, to love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, and with all of your, y'all aren't awake yet, with all of your mind. That's right. That's why we talked about the Thinking Christianly series. And he went on to say this, Jesus said, this is the first and greatest commandment, but the second is just like it, to love your neighbor as yourself. And so this morning, I want to give you some practical ways in which you can apply this truth about loving your neighbor and how to do that effectively in the church as well as outside the four walls of this building. Now, you may be asking me a question just like Jesus was asked. Who is my neighbor? Well, Jesus replied that with a couple of parables about the Good Samaritan. Let me just use a quick illustration for you. If you would, take a look to the person at your right, if you will. Now turn and look to your left and look at the person on your left. Guess what? That's your neighbor, okay? And so is everyone else in this service, and so is everyone else in this church, and so is everyone else in this community, and really, in a sense, so is everyone else in the world. And so your neighbor is that person that God has placed in your life that you can be able to make an investing opportunity. And so the message that the Lord has placed upon my heart to share with you this morning is entitled, <clears throat> Becoming a Welcoming Church. Becoming a Welcoming Church. <clears throat> Would you say our church is a friendly, welcoming church? Yes. I would hope so. I agree with you. I think we are. I'd like to be very clear this morning and say that I feel that we are a very welcoming church to begin with. My experience and my family's experience of Fayetteville First Baptist Church from the very day that we came here has been very warm, very friendly, very welcoming, very encouraging, very positive experience. You have loved us well. We have, been, we have felt welcome from the very first day. But does that mean that that's the same experience for everyone that comes into our church? The reality of that is no. Unfortunately, no matter how friendly and how welcoming we are, that is not the true reality of everyone who comes inside the four walls of this building. And though we are a very welcoming and warm church, I feel that we could always work on becoming an even more welcoming church than we are today. And you know what? That begins with the individual. It begins with me. And it begins with you. And frankly, that starts with us. Unless you are a guest with us today, I'm speaking to you and I'm speaking to me. And if you are a guest with us today, as Pastor Kurt already welcomed you, we want to let you know that we're so glad you're here. Maybe this is your first time to worship with us at Faithful First Baptist Church. And if that's the case, we're so glad you're here. And I hope that you value a church that prioritizes being a welcoming church and doing that better. You heard the congregation say, yeah. I mean, we all think we're probably pretty welcoming because we attend here, but I hope that that's been your experience. In fact, as Pastor Kurt alluded to, in the worship guide, there is a guest connections in there. If you would like, tear that out. Fill it out. Just give us a couple of, a little bit of information from you and place it into the offering plate. I know that's already passed, so turn it into somebody as you leave. Bring it to me at the end of the service. And guess what? One of the jobs that I get to do every week on Monday morning is I love to respond to those, those, those guests. I send an email to every person, I try at least, to every person that fills out that guest connection that visits our church on Sunday to let them know that we're so glad you were here. I think that's important. If you took the time to fill out that guest connection, that tells me that you want to hear a response. And I think we owe you one. You know why we asked you to fill it out? Because we want to connect with you. In that, worst, in that uh, first time guest email, I have in there every time a first time guest survey. We want to know how that we're doing at being a welcoming church. Now, we don't get a lot of them back. In fact, they're anonymous. You don't have to put your name, but they are anonymous, and we don't get a lot of them back, but it's very helpful for us to know how we're doing because we know we can do better. But we appreciate <clears throat> you being here this morning, and if you would, take the time and fill that out. But most importantly, you are important to us, and we're glad you're here. The sermon series, or this message this morning, is based out of a book by Tom Rainer entitled Becoming a Welcoming Church. Tom Rainer is the president and CEO of Lifeway Christian Resources. He is um, 
Actually, if you're going through the Bible Studies for Life Sunday School material right now, this was your Sunday School lesson this morning, and I'm going to hopefully build upon what you've already heard. But our focus passage of Scripture today is 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 8 through 11. So if you turn in your Bible with me to 1 Peter chapter 4, we're going to read verses 8 through 11. And while you're doing that, Tom Rayner did a survey. And he did a survey for first-time guests in churches all over our country. And this morning I want to share some results of that survey, not necessarily any specifically from our church, but churches just like us in our denomination. And I want to share those results with you today and how we can become a more welcoming church. If you would stand with me today, this morning, as we read 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 8 through 11. Above all, love each other deeply, because love covers over a multitude of sins. Offer hospitality to one another without grumbling. Each one should use whatever gift he or she has received to serve others, faithfully administering God's grace in its various forms. Listen closely. If anyone speaks, he or she should do it as one speaking the very words of God. If anyone serves, he should do it with the strength that God provides so that in all things God may be praised through Jesus Christ. To him be the glory and the power forever and ever. Amen. You may be seated. That passage of scripture was written by Peter to challenge the church, to challenge the Christians of his day to be the people that God has called them to be. And he's calling, and that God is calling and speaking to you and to me today. That same message is very clear for how we need to be living and loving one another. The importance, number one in your notes, the importance of being a welcoming church. There's great importance, in case you weren't aware, that we be a welcoming church. Church is not about for me. Remember Pastor Jim talked about some people might think of church as a Walmart to go and get everything that we can for ourselves, but really the church is about how can I give? Not how can I get. Of course, we hope that you're here this morning and getting God's word this morning. You're getting fed. You're getting encouraged. That you're being challenged in God's word. And you're receiving his love and grace as we sang about and as we preach about. But at the same time, that's not an end in itself. We talked about that discipleship is not a cul-de-sac. God wants us to build, find opportunities to build on ramps for you now. That having received to now be able to give and to share what God has done in your life. So there is a great importance of of being a welcoming church. Have you ever realized and thought about this, that this morning, possibly this morning, someone is here today for the very first time. They might actually be here for the very first time to church period. And so therefore today is their first impression of what God is all about. And guess how he's gonna find out? From you. From the impression that you give him and her. That makes our job as Christ followers so important that I'm doing a great job, that I'm doing an effective job, that I'm being aware and being intentional about becoming welcoming and loving in an intentional way for those in this church, not only you who I see every Sunday, but also for those who might be here for the very first time seeking and asking, who is this God that you serve? That first impression is so important. And you know what? I don't want it to be the only impression that they ever see. In his book, Tom Rayner, that I've shared about this morning, he shares the tale of two guests, and I want to share these. These stories are true. Only the names have been changed, and here are the doses of reality, uh, the two doses of reality, uh, and the first one is, is very positive. Let me read it to you. Jane is a stylist. As Jane was cutting my hair, I began a conversation with her about life and the world. Once I found out where she lived, I was able to shift the conversation to Jesus and the church. It's an opportunity where, you know, as Christ followers... Don't miss out on opportunities as you're getting your hair cut or doing whatever God, you know, you're doing your routine of your day to find avenues to build on ramps into people's lives, to connect with them. And guess what happened? Indeed, I found out that she lived near my church where my son pastors. So I talked to Jane about her life. I talked a bit about Jesus and I invited her to our church. Isn't that pretty cool? Little did I know that the Holy Spirit had already been working in her life. I will spare with you the details, but she soon found the website of our church and bravely, her words, not mine, decided to visit. Let me just say this first and foremost. We live in a digital age and a website is probably the first place 
that people go to when they're going to check out a church. And so we try to do a very effective job, not that we have the greatest website of all things, but we try to do an effective job of keeping that thing up to date and important and keeping the things highlighted that we do because we live in a different age than when you and I were, were children. We didn't have websites to go check out. We actually went to the church, but she did. And because of that, she decided to visit. She fell in love with the church. Her words again, not mine. The website gave her all the information that she needed. She found the guest parking spot with ease. The people were genuinely friendly. The preacher preached the Bible with conviction and love. And Jane decided to follow Jesus. She trusted him as her Lord and Savior, and she was baptized. And now she is smiling and enthused, and she's an active member, get this, of the welcome ministry of the church. Perfect person for that, because she just kind of knew what that felt like, being new. It's a great story about how the power of God can work in someone's life, even just from somebody simply saying, why don't you come? Let me share another story. This one's not so great. Ryan, his name is Ryan. I met Ryan at a consultation for a church where we focused on the guest experience. Ryan had almost no church background, but I could tell that he was really searching. So he did something bold, if not audacious, from his perspective. He asked his wife, Bethany, if she and their two young daughters would go to church with him. Bethany had a nominal church background, but she was not really interested in going back to a church. She found the world outside the church more pleasant than the church life. I wonder why. She nevertheless, nevertheless agreed to go with Ryan, with great leadership in Ryan's life. Just one time, she said. And there won't be a second time at that church they visited. To begin, the church website was terrible. It had not been updated with the new time of, worship, of the worship service, so the family of four was late, even though they thought they would arrive on time. Because they arrived late, the church members occupied all the closer parking spots to the church. You ever been there? <laughs> Supposedly, they were guest parking spots, but Ryan could not find any directional signs to them. When they arrived late, a couple at the front door, uh, a couple of the front door greeters spoke to them for at least two seconds. The two greeters then resumed their private conversation, obvious to the world and the people around them. And when they went to the children's area to check in with their two young daughters, disaster struck. The place was dirty, security was weak, and the person that met them complained because they were late. Bethany gave Ryan the look. <laughs> it was not happy. It was not a happy look. It was not a good moment. I'm surprised they even went into the worship service at that point. They both realized that they had made a bad decision. By the way, when members of this church were asked, they consistently proclaimed that our church is very friendly. And you know what? They probably were to their own members and to the people that they knew best and those who were on the inside and not the guests. This morning, I'd like for you, many of you here this morning, I know personally, are somewhat new to our church, but I'd like for you to put your thoughts and your feet into the shoes of what a first-time guest might feel like in our church. I don't know about you, but maybe you've been here for years and years and years and you've forgotten how that feels. Or maybe you're a family who over the last 30 years have moved 20 times and all you know is being a first time guest at places, but we have to put our shoes, our, our, ourselves in the shoes of what it feels like to be a first time guest because like we said this morning, maybe today we're making a first impression for somebody, not only about who the people of God are, but who the God we serve is. And I think it's important that we do all that we can. Of course, I am more interested in myself most often in the times, and so we have to do very intentional things to be thinking of others more naturally than I think of myself. This couple may never return to church again and may never give church a second chance. And my feeling is, is this. We're responsible, and I feel obligated, to anybody who walks in the four walls or the doors of this church to do all that we can to help them connect here. Once they leave or tell us they don't want to be contacted anymore, that's on them. But if they step inside the walls of these church, I believe my responsibility and your responsibility is to do all that we can because we don't know if they'll ever walk in the doors of another church again. And we have to take that as a priority to know what, what can we do as the people of God to connect and invest in their life for the hour or however so that they're here. And that's the importance of becoming a welcoming church to all to all those who come. Churches perceive that they are friendly church because members are friendly to one another. 
but they don't think about walking in the shoes of first-time guests, as I've already mentioned. It's so important that we are a welcoming church. Why? Because most every Sunday, we might have a Jane or a Ryan sitting in our midst. And maybe you are that person today. And for the reason for us becoming a welcome church is not for us to look good, but for God to look good. What did this passage of Scripture say here in 1 in Peter chapter 4? It says, so that, the things, so that all things God may be, may be praised through Jesus Christ to him be all the glory and all the power. I want God to get all the glory and all the praise for what he's doing in my life and in your life. And hopefully that should be reflected and showed in how we treat others. And how we treat our, one another too. Not just the visitors and not just our guests. And not those that are, that, are, that are unsaved that might be in our congregation today. But how we treat one another is a reflection of the God that we serve. And it's also a witness and testimony to those who are looking about what being a Christ follower is all about. So it's so important that we're a welcoming church because God will receive all the glory for what he wants to do in and through our lives. So two, number two, what does a welcoming church look like? Well, look back here at 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse 8. It says this, above all, love each other deeply. Because love covers over a multitude of sins. You know what? I used to not go to church. And I walked into a church one day and they accepted me. They decided that I was somebody worth making a connection with. And I'm glad they did. Because if I hadn't had that connection at that church, I don't know if I would have gone back. And I definitely wouldn't be standing here before you today sharing this message with you had they not. They loved me. Even though I was a lost and goofy 16-year-old teenager that made a lot of bad choices and decisions, and I really kind of went because I saw a girl there that I thought was cute, and that's kind of why I went. (laughs) I mean, I'll be honest, you know. But man, God got a hold of my life because the people in that church, people in that church and in that in that uh, youth ministry and that youth group were different, and they received me. They loved me, man. They 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 treated me like you know. the way Jesus would have treated you know, me. Because you know what? None of us deserve, right? I don't deserve to be loved. But you know what? God, God loves us despite ourselves, right? Man, thank God. And you know what? We get to be the ambassadors. We get to now be the reflections of that same love to other people. Isn't that awesome? Man, I sure hope, I'm just saying a side note, if anybody ever comes in this church and does not dress like we are or does not look like we are, I hope that no one else in this church ever looks down upon them for that. They could be that Ryan and that Bethany or that Jane walk into that church today. We have a huge opportunity to make that first impression in their life about the God that we serve. I don't care if they come and cut off jeans and a whatever. I believe that we're responsible to love them and receive them and still proclaim the, the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ, but until God does the work in their heart and life to whatever that might mean, it's our job to receive them and love them and speak the truth in their life. Is that right? I sure hope so, and I sure hope we're doing that. You know, like I said, I, I have felt nothing but love and encouragement and support from you as a family. This is a warm and friendly church, but I sure hope we, we can do that to every single soul that walks through the doors of this church. It's very, very important, but we need to love each other deeply. This passage of Scripture goes on to say, offer hospitality to one another without grumbling. You know, <laughs> a lot of grumbling sometimes in church, you know. But sometimes we've got to get our heart and mind on the right, right priorities. You know, and if, and if you don't feel like anybody else is doing what you should be doing, or you think, you know, you keep doing it. You be faithful to whatever it is that God has called you to do and how he's called you to do it in the life of the church. And if somebody else doesn't step up to help and serve, you know what, that's, that's on them. But it's not my job to grumble and complain because I want to serve and do what I, I feel God's called me to do out of a sense of joy and a sense of purpose and a sense of obedience, not out of a sense of duty or a sense of obligation. And because I want to make sure that my heart and my intentions for doing them are in the right place. And so we have to be very careful because when we grumble and complain, that is a reflection as the people of God, as Christ's followers onto this lost and, and sinful world, Right? And so we need to be very careful to offer hospitality to one another. Hospitality is important. Each one should use whatever gift and, and, and use your God-given gifts to serve one another. Our gifts that God's given us aren't to glorify ourselves, but to serve you, to serve one another. 
Every single one of you, if you're a Christ follower here today, has been gifted with spiritual gifts to be used in service for others. Not for yourself, for others. I'm preaching to the choir, I know that, but I'm just encouraging to say that's what the church is. This is a beautiful picture painted in 1 Peter chapter 4 this morning about what the church should be like. Using your God-given gifts to serve. And lastly, let your speech be edifying and encouraging to one another. You know, we've talked about the taming of the tongue. How the tongue is one of, I believe, the most powerful uh, muscles or whatever you want to call it in our whole body. And the words that we say to one another can be so tearing down or building up. And we can literally... Our tongues hold the power of life and death, in my, in my opinion. If we confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised from the dead, you will be saved. But with that same tongues, we can tear down our brothers and sisters in Christ, can't we? And it's a reflection to the world outside or maybe even to those here this morning for the first time. I don't want anything to do with God because his people are not very good loving people. Now I know I'm a sinner and I still sin every day, <laughs> but that's no excuse for me not to be transformed as we sang the song from the inside out for God to do a work as a Christ follower. Guess what? The power, the, 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 the presence of God lives in my life to do what? To conform me more to his image and my life should be different. It should reflect the very things that we're talking about in 1 Peter chapter four. My life, my speech should be glorifying and edifying to God. Man, we gotta be careful, church. I'm just telling you this. I'm not speaking to anybody in particular or to Fayetteville First Baptist Church in particular, but as Christians, man, we can really abuse each other with our tongues. And let's just not talk about the first-time guest right now. Let's just talk about each other, man. If I'm getting torn down or, uh, by, by another brother or sister in Christ or whatever that might be, I may not come back. Let alone a first-time guest that just sees that and perceives that. Man, I just want to encourage each of us as brothers and sisters in Christ to filter everything. You know what I do? I filter everything through this thought. Is, is what I'm saying building them up or is it tearing them down? Is what I'm saying building myself up or is it building up the body of Christ? And that's a good filter. And you know what? I fail at it many times, but it's a good reminder for me every time I start to speak to somebody that question to guard put a guard on our tongues because that's so powerful our tongues can be so hurtful so what is hospitality the, the, you know the Bible has many verses on hospitality for example Paul wrote to the church in Rome and simply said pursue hospitality and Paul told Timothy and the leaders in the church must be hospitable and overseer uh, therefore must be above reproach the husband of one wife self-controlled sensible respectable hospitable able to teach not to uh, not an excess in drink uh, a, a drinker not a bully but a gentle gentle not quarrelsome not greedy the bible's word for hospitality literally means to love others or to love the stranger that person we don't know not in your circle of, uh, of friends. It's only natural that we gravitate to people we know best and those who are like us. It's easier to interact with people with whom we share a common interest with or have a similar background with. The problem arises though, and there's nothing wrong with that, but the problem arises though when those friendships drive us to overlook others or ignore them or worse, show preferential treatment. In fact, just three pages back in my Bible, Jesus, I mean, uh, James speaks to this preferential treatment in James chapter two. Let me just read it. Chapter two, verse one and following. He says this, my brothers, as believers in our Lord Jesus Christ, don't show favoritism. Suppose a man comes into your meeting wearing a gold ring and fine clothes and a poor man in shabby clothes also comes in. If you show special attention to the man wearing fine clothes and say, hey, Here's a great seat for you, but you say to the poor man, you go sit over there or sit on the floor by my feet. Have you not discriminated among those you, yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Listen, my dear brothers, has not God chosen those who are poor in the eyes of the world to be rich in faith and inherit the kingdom he promised those who, we love, him, who love him? But you have insulted the poor. Is it not the rich who are exploiting you? Are they not the ones who are dragging you into court? Are they not the ones who are slandering the noble name of him whom you belong? 
if you really keep the royal law found in Scripture, love your neighbor as, we, as yourself, you're doing right. But if you show favoritism, you sin and are convicted by the law as lawbreakers. We are called to love everyone, even the stranger. Obviously, look at the Good Samaritan, the parable that Jesus teach, taught. There may be some Ryans and some Janes and Bethanies in our worship time this morning. If you are, we're glad you're here. There may be some next Sunday. There may be some every Sunday we gather. And we are to be on our best behavior, not just today, but every day. Not when I say best behavior. We need to be who God called us to be. We need to be the people of God and act like the people of God. And today may be the first impression that we can give someone about what a Christ follower is and who this God that we serve is. Jesus said, by this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. Our graciousness and hospitality to those outside our circle of friends attract people to the gospel that we profess. Let me just say that again. Our graciousness and hospitality that we show to one another is what attracts people to the gospel of Jesus Christ. If I hate you and I show that I, uh, through my actions, uh, you know, that, uh, that, that I'm unloving towards you, then somebody's going to see that and say, I don't want anything to do with your God. I don't want anything to do with Christianity. Because that's not what God's called us to be. We are giving impressions to others of what the character of God is. And let's make sure that they are good and accurate impressions. And in fact, this is the Chick-fil-A model. They're not just selling chicken. I love their chicken sandwich. But they're not just selling chicken. They're selling hospitality. Within five miles of our church, you can go and get a chicken sandwich. Not today, Chick-fil-A. But, uh, <laughs> and thank God for that. Praise God for that. Absolutely. But within five miles of our church, you can go get a chicken sandwich on tomorrow. Maybe not tomorrow, but well, yeah, tomorrow. Regardless. But people choose to go to Chick-fil-A. Why? Because when you walk in the door... It's their what? It's their pleasure to serve you. Where in the world do you go today and get that feeling that it's their pleasure to serve you? Now, you know what? I hope my children, when they get to the age of being able to work, go and get trained by those people and those owner operators because I want my children, no matter where they work, no matter what they do in life, to realize that it is a pleasure to serve someone else. It is a pleasure to serve someone else. No matter if you, whatever you do, you should serve with that heart mentality. And when you walk into the church, the church should be here because it is our pleasure to worship God. It's our pleasure to serve you. And it's our pleasure to have you. And if you're sitting in my seat when I walk in because I sit in that seat every Sunday, guess what? I'm going to sit somewhere else. But I'm going to go and speak to that person because they aren't used to being here on a Sunday. They know that's my seat, right? <laughs> Am I going to go up to them and say, oh, excuse me, you know what happens. I'm sorry, you're in our seat. And if that was a Ryan or a Jane, do you think that they would go find another seat or do you think they would leave? Y'all, I'm just telling you, I've been in church work for a lot of years. Those people leave. And many times they never come back. I want my children to realize, and I hope that you, as, the child, as, as Christ followers, realize, you know, that it is, it is a pleasure. We should serve and do what we can uh, for, the, for the Lord because it's a pleasure. And you know what? The thing, great thing about Chick-fil-A is, no matter if the order's messed up or not, and it's usually my fault, it's, it's their problem. I mean, it's, it's, they'll take care of it, right? They'll always take care of it. You know, the reason why Chick-fil-A does what they do is because they're built on godly principles. They're founded on Christian principles. They, there are being such great examples of what a follower of Christ should be doing wherever they live, work, and play. And I hope that every time you walk into one, this is no commercial by any means, but every time you walk into one, let that be a reminder to you as how we should be in the church. I mean, they're doing the very thing. I think it's a great example of uh, what they're doing in their business of what we should be doing in our life, frankly. We are not to only be loving the people inside the four walls of the church, but in the marketplace as well, and in the workplace, wherever you live, and in your neighborhoods. Our lives should serve as a welcome mat into the church. Our lives should serve as a welcome mat 
into the church. So how can we become a more welcoming church? Let's move to the third point. Let's be practical. I'm pragmatic. It starts with the individual. Are you willing to do what it takes to be a welcoming, gospel-centered church? It starts with us living out our lives as if Christ was living his life through us. It calls for us to surrender. In this book study, Tom Rayner took a survey. I mentioned that earlier of, I don't know how many thousands of people who were first-time guests in churches. And they definitely have a list of things not to do. But I want to share with you the things that were the positive, the top 10 positive responses from first-time guests that were, that were great experiences. And so, and I've also included not only the top 10, but a, a quote from someone specific within this survey. Again, these are not from our church, but they could very well be associated. Number one, someone asked the guest to sit with her. Someone invited the guest to sit with them. And here's the quote, you know, as a single person, I can feel pretty lonely sitting by myself. I'm so glad Joni asked me to sit with her. We plan to get together for coffee. You know, that's so important. Speak to the people who sit around you. I did that cheesy thing where you look to your left, look to your right. You know, sometimes we come into church and, you know, we're so focused and, and we forget that there's people around us to actually connect with and get to know them. If you regularly attend here, you should know the people who sit around you. You should know the people, hopefully, well enough to know if you don't recognize somebody, that that might mean they're a guest and introduce yourself. And then... If you, feel, if you meet people coming in, maybe through your Sunday school class or through the hallways, invite them to sit with you. And if you feel the Lord's prompting you, invite them to go to lunch with you. Number two, people introduce themselves to the guests. The quote, several people introduced themselves to me. I did not get the impression it was either contrived or routine. It was genuine. It was heartfelt. You know, we're a warm, friendly church and that's what comes across. I, I lead our new member class, our next step class. And that's the overall consensus that I get is that our church has been very friendly, very welcoming. People have said, you know, we've, we were just so welcome. We've been, people speak to us. And I'll be honest with you, that's why they stayed. That's why they joined the church. Somebody spoke to us. Somebody invited us to Sunday school. Somebody cared about us enough to actually speak to us. And so if you get into the worship services early, I encourage you to. Go around and mingle. I think it's great. When I get in here early, usually I teach late because I'm a long-winded person, if you didn't know that. Um, but uh, I had Rock teach today, so we got early, got on time. But uh, get in here early and mingle. Get to know people. If you don't know somebody, let that be an opportunity for you to engage and connect. You're already doing this. I said I'm preaching to the choir, but just in case you're not, we can always do better at this. Number three, there was clear signage in the church. From the parking lot to the children's area to the worship center, everything was clearly marked. It was, it was easy to navigate. You know, you and I, if you're a regular attender here, we don't need signs. We know where we're going. But if you're a first-time guest, you have no idea. If you look at our church from out on the street, you got like the small, medium, and large, you know, sanctuary size, right? You don't know which one to go in. You don't know which door to go in. Which, which place are they having the service at? So it's hard. So if you know if somebody that's coming to our church for the very first time, give them a specific designated spot that you're going to meet them. In fact, we have a guest connection center right out here in front of the library. But that's not the only place. In fact, it's probably the least trafficked place in our church. So we are planning, in fact, I'm preaching this just to say, this is something we're intentionally doing at our church. We're adding two more guest connection centers here at our church at our other two major, probably more so, major entrances to our church. So that when people walk in the door, our greeters do a great job of handshaking and welcoming, and many of them do a great job even knowing your names. It's awesome. But after they get past the greeters, they might not know where to go. And so those connection centers will be right there behind the greeters to be able to be hosts for you. And so if God has put that on your heart, just like we talked about with Jane in her testimony about how she's a part of that, if God has put on you, your heart, that you would like to be a host or a hostess at one of these guest connection centers on Sunday mornings, when somebody, a family or individual walks in for the first time, you get to have the pleasure of being able to host them and get them to where they need to go. Not just saying it's down the hall to your right, but you get to walk with them. But signage is so important, and it's important that we have clear signage. Number four, there was clearly marked welcome center. I just mentioned this. It made it really easy for me to ask questions and to get some information of the church. We, as I mentioned, are beginning to add a couple more of these. And we need to staff them, staff them with people like you who know our church well, who can smile, introduce yourself, and serve them. Number five, the kids love the children's area. 
My kids were so happy with their experiences. We will be back. We will be back for sure. You know that children's and preschool and youth ministry areas are they're the most crucial part of a first-time guest experience. Now, a family, you know, maybe the parents didn't really have a good time, but man, if the kids do, oh man, we're going to definitely come back. We hope the adults have a good time, but the important thing is, is that our, our children's and preschool and youth ministries, in fact, if you work in our preschool children's and, and youth ministries, thank you for what you do, because without you, we wouldn't have the families that come to our church. We wouldn't have an opportunity to minister and to engage with them like we do. So thank you for the sacrifices that you've made. Thank you for serving and using your God-given gifts to do the things that you feel God leading you to do so that we can love on these children. We can love on these youth and make a difference in their life and help disciple them to be the men and women that God has called them to be. And I thank you for your work and your service and the sacrifice that you've made because your job is so crucial. And we want to do everything we can as a church to help you and support you and encourage you and do it all that we can to make sure that you have what you need to do your job well. Six, the children's area was secure and sanitary. That is one of the first things that I check when I go to a church. This church gets an A+. Plus. You know, we're not uh, a perfect church in the sense of, uh, you know, I mean, we're, we're, we're probably pretty clean, but here's what I'm going to say is uh, on Sunday mornings, we have one custodian here on staff. And so if you see some trash, pick it up. If you see something that needs to be done, maybe if you have time and the ability, yeah, help us out. Take ownership of this building and what we can do together, you know, just the simple things. But if there is a major catastrophe or, you know, something that's going on that you don't have the time or ability to do, we do have a custodian here in the building that's, that's, uh, that's available to take care of that. But that's important, that it's clean, and not only that, that it's secure. I don't think I've ever seen a parent complain as a first-time guest to go out to the Guest Connection Center and have to fill out the paperwork, you know, for their child. But because of what they see is that it's a very secure safe environment for their kids. We live in a day and age where that's important. And if I don't sense that, I'm not coming back. And so I'm thankful that we have the people sitting at the, guest, the Children's Connection desk. I'm thankful that we have the security measures in place. And John Jackson, thank you for the security team and for those of you who do serve on the security team to make us and give us the sense that we are doing all that we can to keep this place safe and secure. Number seven, guest parking was clearly visible. From the moment we drove into the parking lot, I could find the guest parking. It was marked very well. You know, we have a lot of things that we've mentioned here that we could be doing better, and I think that that's one of them. Like I said, if you come here regularly, you know where to park, but if you're a first-time guest, it's kind of hard to know where. In fact, we do have some guest parking. I think it's labeled out here, and so let me just, just throw out this thought. If you kind of come here regularly, you're not a guest. I kind of, in fact, I'd like to rename those when we do this very soon. I'd like to rename those signs first-time guest parking because sometimes people don't know really how long they're a guest, <laughs> you know? I've been a guest here for 10 years. <laughs> Yeah, thanks for having those parking spots out there for me. No, man, if you know where you're going and this isn't your first time here, save those. And I know some of us need to have a closer parking spot. Of course, in the earlier service, um, they get here early and they get a lot of the good closer ones, but get here earlier and try to get a good parking. But I try, and as a staff, we've tried to park as far away as we can to free up. I mean, it'd be nice to park right outside the door, but we try to park as far away as we can. If you have the opportunity to do that, do that and sacrifice a close parking spot for those. But that's something we can do better is at least some sign in our parking lots. In fact, one of the things that we're trying to do as a part of this first impression team is what we're calling it, because that's what it is. It's a first impression team is to have somebody in our parking lots as a part of this greeter first impression ministry, just pointing people where to go. You're a first time guest. Here's some guest parking. Number eight, the church did not have a stand and greet time. Now this may sound kind of funny. My wife and I just moved to the area and we are visiting churches. If we visit one with that fake stand and greet time, we don't return. Isn't that kind of funny? I always read that and thought, wow, I, th I like our stand and greet time, but this is the reason why people don't like it. This is in a survey of thousands of first-time guests, and you know why? Maybe you can identify with this. Guests get ignored. It goes back to that old day deal. Is I'm going to go to people that I know. Hey, how are y'all doing? Good to see you. Well, what about the person that knows no one? And that's why they're negative. That's why they haven't been good. And so we intentionally, and it might be funny, I'm a, you know me, I'm a very engaging personal person. I love to give hugs and, and do all I can. And, and so that, that to me, that time is cool. But for others, it's frightening. And so we have tried to be a little bit seeker friendly, if you will, in that regard. But when we do do those things, think about that. Try not to think inside the box, think outside the box. Just 
how would it feel again to put myself in the place of somebody who's new? And if you're somebody in this worship center that I don't recognize and I have, I have the opportunity, the time, go and speak to them. Number nine, the members were not pushy. They seem to really care about us rather than just making us another number on the membership roll. You know, God is in the people business and we gotta remember that that's what we're in, <laughs> the people business and making connections with people. And number 10, the guest card was simple to complete. You know, we put that guest card in the, uh, uh, in the worship guide and it's, it's a little obtrusive, but you know, it gives us a little bit of information, give us, a, us all you're willing to give us. But some of the cards in other churches ask for too much information. This one was perfect and simple. That was a, a remark from this survey. So we're trying to do all that we can to make that as well as effective. So let me wrap up this sermon this morning, this challenge for you today and for myself today is this. Though the majority of churches in America are not closed to outsiders, we're certainly open to anyone, right? Many of us have a bunker mentality. They stay safe and warm on their own church property. But being a welcoming church means that we engage others not only inside our four walls, but we also engage others with the gospel of Jesus Christ by going where they are outside the four walls of the church. That's what the church is supposed to be. It's not just here and waiting for people to come, but to do the very thing as we read in that testimony of Jane is that somebody actually invited her. I know I'm preaching to the choir because I meet so many people here. In fact, one lady in our Sunday school class this morning shared that she's here because her neighbors invited her. And now her dad's coming and now her niece is coming because her neighbor invited her. Y'all, it's not hard to be the hands and feet of Jesus Christ in this community to just reach out to those that God places in your life to reach out and engage with them. By not waiting to receive those you happen to visit, but instead of going out and inviting them to come and join us, we can all do this. So my encouragement, my challenge as we close today is this. Um, I feel we, we're a warm, welcoming church because I know you <laughs> and because you know me. Because we're friendly to one another. But let's start thinking in the sense of how it feels to be a first time guest. Not that you're not already, but walk into the service and walk into Sunday school, walk into the church, period, about what it might be like. Who is it that I might meet today that's here for the first time? And how can I, Lord, be an impact in their life and them having a positive experience today? We are, like I said earlier, responsible, I believe, for everyone who walks through these doors and doing our best and putting our best foot forward of making the best connection we, we can. So that's my encouragement to you today. I hope that some of what I shared, this is what I'm trying to live out in my life. I'm not perfect at it. Um, I'm passionate about it. But just like you, it doesn't take much to just engage and use your everyday opportunities that you're out and about in this community to build bridges and on-ramps into people's lives. And it's easy to do that.